Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens by J. M. Barry. Chapter 1. Peter Pan. If you ask your mother whether she knew about Peter Pan when she was a little girl she will say, why, of course, I did. And if you ask her whether he rode on a goat in those days she will say, what a foolish question to ask, certainly he did. Then if you ask your grandmother whether she knew about Peter Pan when she was a girl, she also says, why, of course, but if you ask her whether he rode on a goat in those days, she says she never heard of his having a goat. Perhaps she has forgotten, just as she sometimes forgets your name and calls you Mildred, which is your mother's name. Still, she could hardly forget such an important thing as the goat. Therefore there was no goat when your grandmother was a little girl. This shows that, in telling the story of Peter Pan, to begin with the goat, as most people do, is as silly as to put on your jacket before your vest. Of course, it also shows that Peter is ever so old, but he is really always the same age, so that does not matter in the least. His age is one week, and though he was born so long ago he has never had a birthday, nor is there the slightest chance of his ever having one. The reason is that he escaped from being a human when he was seven days old, he escaped by the window and flew back to the Kensington Gardens. If you think he was the only baby who ever wanted to escape, it shows how completely you have forgotten your own young days. When David heard this story first he was quite certain that he had never tried to escape, but I told him to think back hard, pressing his hands to his temples, and when he had done this hard, and even harder, he distinctly remembered a youthful desire to return to the treetops, and with that memory came others, as that he had lain in bed planning to escape as soon as his mother was asleep, and how she had once caught him halfway up the chimney. All children could have such recollections if they would press their hands hard to their temples, for, having been birds before they were human, they are naturally a little wild during the first few weeks, and very itchy at the shoulders, where their wings used to be. So David tells me. I ought to mention here that the following is our way with a story. First, I tell it to him, and then he tells it to me, the understanding being that it is quite a different story, and then I retell it with his additions, and so we go on until no one could say whether it is more his story or mine. In this story of Peter Pan, for instance, the bald narrative and most of the moral reflections are mine, though not all, for this boy can be a stern moralist, but the interesting bits about the ways and customs of babies in the bird stage are mostly reminiscences of David's, recalled by pressing his hands to his temples and thinking hard. Well, Peter Pan got out by the window, which had no bars. Standing on the ledge he could see trees far away, which were doubtless the Kensington Gardens, and the moment he saw them he entirely forgot that he was now a little boy in a nightgown, and away he flew, right over the houses to the gardens. It is wonderful that he could fly without wings, but the place itched tremendously, and, perhaps we could all fly if we were as dead confident sure of our capacity to do it as was bold Peter Pan that evening. He alighted gaily on the open sward, between the baby's palace and the serpentine, and the first thing he did was to lie on his back and kick. He was quite unaware already that he had ever been human, and thought he was a bird, even in appearance, just the same as in his early days, and when he tried to catch a fly he did not understand that the reason he missed it was because he had attempted to seize it with his hand, which, of course, a bird never does. He saw, however, that it must be past lockout time, for there were a good many fairies about, all too busy to notice him, they were getting breakfast ready, milking their cows, drawing water, and so on, and the sight of the water pails made him thirsty, so he flew over to the round pond to have a drink. He stooped, and dipped his beak in the pond, he thought it was his beak, but, of course, it was only his nose, and, Therefore, very little water came up, and that not so refreshing as usual, so next he tried a puddle, 
and he fell flop into it. When a real bird falls in flop, he spreads out his feathers and pecks them dry, but Peter could not remember what was the thing to do, and he decided, rather sulkily, to go to sleep on the weeping beach in the baby walk. At first he found some difficulty in balancing himself on a branch, but presently he remembered the way, and fell asleep. He awoke long before morning, shivering, and saying to himself, I never was out in such a cold night, he had really been out in colder nights when he was a bird, but, of course, as everybody knows, what seems a warm night to a bird is a cold night to a boy in a nightgown. Peter also felt strangely uncomfortable, as if his head was stuffy, he heard loud noises that made him look round sharply, though they were really himself sneezing. There was something he wanted very much, but, though he knew he wanted it, he could not think what it was. What he wanted so much was his mother to blow his nose, but that never struck him, so he decided to appeal to the fairies for enlightenment. They are reputed to know a good deal. There were two of them strolling along the baby walk, with their arms round each other's waists, and he hopped down to address them. The fairies have their tiffs with the birds, but they usually give a civil answer to a civil question, and he was quite angry when these two ran away the moment they saw him. Another was lolling on a garden chair, reading a postage stamp which some human had let fall, and when he heard Peter's voice he popped in alarm behind a tulip. To Peter's bewilderment he discovered that every fairy he met fled from him. A band of workmen, who were sawing down a toadstool, rushed away, leaving their tools behind them. A milkmaid turned her pail upside down and hid in it. Soon the gardens were in an uproar. Crowds of fairies were running this way and that, asking each other stoutly, who was afraid, lights were extinguished, doors barricaded, and from the grounds of Queen Mab's palace came the rubber-dub of drums, showing that the royal guard had been called out. A regiment of lancers came charging down the broad walk, armed with holly leaves, with which they jog the enemy horribly in passing. Peter heard the little people crying everywhere that there was a human in the gardens after lockout time, but he never thought for a moment that he was the human. He was feeling stuffier and stuffier, and more and more wistful to learn what he wanted done to his nose, but he pursued them with the vital question in vain, the timid creatures ran from him, and even the lancers, when he approached them up the hump, turned swiftly into a side walk, on the pretense that they saw him there. Despairing of the fairies, he resolved to consult the birds, but now he remembered, as an odd thing, that all the birds on the weeping beach had flown away when he alighted on it, and though that had not troubled him at the time, he saw its meaning now. Every living thing was shunning him. Poor little Peter Pan, he sat down and cried, and even then he did not know that, for a bird, he was sitting on his wrong part. It is a blessing that he did not know, for otherwise he would have lost faith in his power to fly, and the moment you doubt whether you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. The reason birds can fly and we can't is simply that they have perfect faith, for to have faith is to have wings. Now, except by flying, no one can reach the island in the serpentine, for the boats of humans are forbidden to land there, and there are stakes round it, standing up in the water, on each of which a bird sentinel sits by day and night. It was to the island that Peter now flew to put his strange case before old Solomon Kaur, and he alighted on it with relief, much heartened to find himself at last at home, as the birds call the island. All of them were asleep, including the sentinels, except Solomon, who was wide awake on one side, and he listened quietly to Peter's adventures, and then told him their true meaning. Look at your nightgown, if you don't believe me, Solomon said, and with staring eyes Peter looked at his nightgown, and then at the sleeping birds. Not one of them wore anything. How many of your toes are thumbs? Said Solomon a little cruelly, and Peter saw to his consternation, 
that all his toes were fingers. The shock was so great that it drove away his cold. Ruffle your feathers, said that grim old Solomon, and Peter tried most desperately hard to ruffle his feathers, but he had none. Then he rose up, quaking, and for the first time since he stood on the window ledge, he remembered a lady who had been very fond of him. I think I shall go back to mother, he said timidly. Goodbye, replied Solomon Kaur with a queer look. But Peter hesitated. Why don't you go? The old one asked politely. I suppose, said Peter huskily, I suppose I can still fly? You see, he had lost faith. Poor little half and half, said Solomon, who was not really hard-hearted, you will never be able to fly again, not even on windy days. You must live here on the island always, and never even go to the Kensington Gardens? Peter asked, tragically. How could you get across? said Solomon. He promised very kindly, however, to teach Peter as many of the bird ways as could be learned by one of such an awkward shape. Then I shan't be exactly a human, Peter asked. No. Nor exactly a bird? No. What shall I be? You will be a betwixt and between, Solomon said, and certainly he was a wise old fellow, for that is exactly how it turned out. The birds on the island never got used to him. His oddities tickled them every day, as if they were quite new, though it was really the birds that were new. They came out of the eggs daily, and laughed at him at once, then off they soon flew to be humans, and other birds came out of other eggs, and so it went on forever. The crafty mother birds, when they tired of sitting on their eggs, used to get the young one to break their shells a day before the right time by whispering to them that now was their chance to see Peter washing or drinking or eating. Thousands gathered round him daily to watch him do these things, just as you watch the peacocks, and they screamed with delight when he lifted the crusts they flung him with his hands instead of in the usual way with the mouth. All his food was brought to him from the gardens at Solomon's orders by the birds. He would not eat worms or insects, which they thought very silly of him, so they brought him bread in their beaks. Thus, when you cry out, Greedy! Greedy! To the bird that flies away with the big crust, you know now that you ought not to do this, for he is very likely taking it to Peter Pan. Peter wore no nightgown now. You see, the birds were always begging him for bits of it to line their nests with, and, being very good-natured, he could not refuse, so by Solomon's advice he had hidden what was left of it. But, though he was now quite naked, you must not think that he was cold or unhappy. He was usually very happy and gay, and the reason was that Solomon had kept his promise and taught him many of the bird ways. To be easily pleased, for instance, and always to be really doing something, and to think that whatever he was doing was a thing of vast importance. Peter became very clever at helping the birds to build their nests, soon he could build better than a wood pigeon and nearly as well as a blackbird, though never did he satisfy the finches, and he made nice little water troughs near the nests and dug up worms for the young ones with his fingers. He also became very learned in bird law, and knew an east wind from a west wind by its smell, and he could see the grass growing and hear the insects walking about inside the tree trunks. But the best thing Solomon had done was to teach him to have a glad heart, all birds have glad hearts unless you rob their nests, and so as they were the only kind of heart Solomon knew about, it was easy to him to teach Peter how to have one. Peter's heart was so glad that he felt he must sing all day long, just as the birds sing for joy, but, being partly human, he needed an instrument, so he made a pipe of reeds, and he used to sit by the shore of the island of an evening practicing the sough of the wind and the ripple of the water, and catching handfuls of the shine of the moon, and he put them all in his pipe and played them so beautifully that even the birds were deceived, and they would say to each other, 
Was that a fish leaping in the water or was it Peter playing leaping fish on his pipe? And sometimes he played the birth of birds, and then the mothers would turn round in their nests to see whether they had laid an egg. If you are a child of the gardens you must know the chestnut tree near the bridge, which comes out in flower first of all the chestnuts, but perhaps you have not heard why this tree leads the way. It is because Peter wearies for summer and plays that it has come, and the chestnut being so near, hears him and is cheated. But as Peter sat by the shore tootling divinely on his pipe he sometimes fell into sad thoughts and then the music became sad also, and the reason of all this sadness was that he could not reach the gardens, though he could see them through the arch of the bridge. He knew he could never be a real human again, and scarcely wanted to be one. But oh, how he longed to play as other children play, and of course there is no such lovely place to play in as the gardens. The birds brought him news of how boys and girls play, and wistful tears started in Peter's eyes. Perhaps you wonder why he did not swim across. The reason was that he could not swim. He wanted to know how to swim, but no one on the island knew the way except the ducks, and they are so stupid. They were quite willing to teach him, but all they could say about it was, you sit down on the top of the water in this way, and then you kick out like that. Peter tried it often, but always before he could kick out he sank. What he really needed to know was how you sit on the water without sinking, and they said it was quite impossible to explain such an easy thing as that. Occasionally swans touched on the island, and he would give them all his day's food and then ask them how they sat on the water, but as soon as he had no more to give them the hateful things hissed at him and sailed away. Once he really thought he had discovered a way of reaching the gardens. A wonderful white thing, like a runaway newspaper, floated high over the island and then tumbled, rolling over and over after the manner of a bird that has broken its wing. Peter was so frightened that he hid, but the birds told him it was only a kite, and what a kite is, and that it must have tugged its string out of a boy's hand, and soared away. After that they laughed at Peter for being so fond of the kite, he loved it so much that he even slept with one hand on it, and I think this was pathetic and pretty, for the reason he loved it was because it had belonged to a real boy. To the birds this was a very poor reason, but the older ones felt grateful to him at this time because he had nursed a number of fledglings through the German measles, and they offered to show him how birds fly a kite. So six of them took the end of the string in their beaks and flew away with it, and to his amazement it flew after them and went even higher than they. Peter screamed out, Do it again! And with great good nature they did it several times, and always instead of thanking them he cried, Do it again! Which shows that even now he had not quite forgotten what it was to be a boy. At last, with a grand design burning within his brave heart, he begged them to do it once more with him clinging to the tail, and now a hundred flew off with the string, and Peter clung to the tail, meaning to drop off when he was over the gardens. But the kite broke to pieces in the air, and he would have drowned in the serpentine had he not caught hold of two indignant swans and made them carry him to the island. After this the birds said that they would help him no more in his mad enterprise. Nevertheless, Peter did reach the gardens at last by the help of Shelley's boat, as I am now to tell you. Chapter 2 The Thrush's Nest Shelley was a young gentleman and as grown up as he need ever expect to be. He was a poet, and they are never exactly grown up. They are people who despise money except what you need for today, and he had all that and five pounds over. So, when he was walking in the Kensington Gardens, he made a paper boat of his banknote, and sent it sailing on the serpentine. It reached the island at night, and the lookout brought it to Solomon Kaur, who thought at first that it was the usual thing, a message from a lady, saying she would be obliged if he could let her have a good one. They always ask for the best one he has, 
and if he likes the letter he sends one from class A, but if it ruffles him he sends very funny ones indeed. Sometimes he sends none at all, and at another time he sends a nestful, it all depends on the mood you catch him in. He likes you to leave it all to him, and if you mention particularly that you hope he will see his way to making it a boy this time, he is almost sure to send another girl. And whether you are a lady or only a little boy who wants a baby sister, always take pains to write your address clearly. You can't think what a lot of babies Solomon has sent to the wrong house. Shelley's boat, when opened, completely puzzled Solomon, and he took counsel of his assistants, who having walked over it twice, first with their toes pointed out, and then with their toes pointed in, decided that it came from some greedy person who wanted five. They thought this because there was a large five printed on it. Preposterous, cried Solomon in a rage, and he presented it to Peter, anything useless which drifted upon the island was usually given to Peter as a plaything. But he did not play with his precious banknote, for he knew what it was at once, having been very observant during the week when he was an ordinary boy. With so much money, he reflected, he could surely at last contrive to reach the gardens, and he considered all the possible ways, and decided, wisely, I think, to choose the best way. But, first, he had to tell the birds of the value of Shelley's boat, and though they were too honest to demand it back, he saw that they were galled, and they cast such black looks at Solomon, who was rather vain of his cleverness, that he flew away to the end of the island, and sat there very depressed with his head buried in his wings. Now Peter knew that unless Solomon was on your side, you never got anything done for you in the island, so he followed him and tried to hearten him. Nor was this all that Peter did to pin the powerful old fellow's goodwill. You must know that Solomon had no intention of remaining in office all his life. He looked forward to retiring by and by, and devoting his green old age to a life of pleasure on a certain new stump in the figs which had taken his fancy, and for years he had been quietly filling his stocking. It was a stocking belonging to some bathing person which had been cast upon the island, and at the time I speak of it contained a hundred and eighty crumbs, thirty-four nuts, sixteen crusts, a pen wiper and a boot lace. When his stocking was full, Solomon calculated that he would be able to retire on a competency. Peter now gave him a pound. He cut it off his banknote with a sharp stick. This made Solomon his friend for ever, and after the two had consulted together they called a meeting of the thrushes. You will see presently why thrushes only were invited. The scheme to be put before them was really Peter's, but Solomon did most of the talking, because he soon became irritable if other people talked. He began by saying that he had been much impressed by the superior ingenuity shown by the thrushes in nest building, and this put them into good humor at once, as it was meant to do, for all the quarrels between birds are about the best way of building nests. Other birds, said Solomon, omitted to line their nests with mud, and as a result they did not hold water. Here he cocked his head as if he had used an unanswerable argument, but, unfortunately, a Mrs. Finch had come to the meeting uninvited, and she squeaked out, we don't build nests to hold water, but to hold eggs, and then the thrushes stopped cheering, and Solomon was so perplexed that he took several sips of water. Consider, he said at last, how warm the mud makes the nest. Consider, cried Mrs. Finch, that when water gets into the nest it remains there and your little ones are drowned. The thrushes begged Solomon with a look to say something crushing in reply to this, but again he was perplexed. Try another drink, suggested Mrs. Finch pertly. Kate was her name, and all Kates are saucy. Solomon did try another drink, and it inspired him. If said he, a finch's nest is placed on the serpentine it fills and breaks to pieces, but a thrush's nest is still as dry as the cup of a swan's back. 
How the thrushes applauded. Now they knew why they lined their nests with mud, and when Mrs. Finch called out, We don't place our nests on the serpentine, they did what they should have done at first, chased her from the meeting. After this it was most orderly. What they had been brought together to hear, said Solomon, was this, their young friend, Peter Pan, as they well knew, wanted very much to be able to cross to the gardens, and he now proposed, with their help, to build a boat. At this the thrushes began to fidget, which made Peter tremble for his scheme. Solomon explained hastily that what he meant was not one of the cumbrous boats that humans use, the proposed boat was to be simply a thrush's nest large enough to hold Peter. But still, to Peter's agony, the thrushes were sulky. We are very busy people, they grumbled, and this would be a big job. Quite so, said Solomon, and, of course, Peter would not allow you to work for nothing. You must remember that he is now in comfortable circumstances, and he will pay you such wages as you have never been paid before. Peter Pan authorizes me to say that you shall all be paid sixpence a day. Then all the thrushes hopped for joy, and that very day was begun the celebrated building of the boat. All their ordinary business fell into arrears. It was the time of year when they should have been pairing, but not a thrush's nest was built except this big one, and so Solomon soon ran short of thrushes with which to supply the demand from the mainland. The stout, rather greedy children, who look so well in perambulators but get puffed easily when they walk, were all young thrushes once, and ladies often ask specially for them. What do you think Solomon did? He sent over to the housetops for a lot of sparrows and ordered them to lay their eggs in old thrushes' nests and sent their young to the ladies and swore they were all thrushes. It was known afterward on the island as the sparrow's year, and so, when you meet, as you doubtless sometimes do, grown-up people who puff and blow as if they thought themselves bigger than they are, very likely they belong to that year. You ask them. Peter was a just master and paid his work people every evening. They stood in rows on the branches, waiting politely while he cut the paper sixpences out of his banknote, and presently he called the roll, and then each bird, as the names were mentioned, flew down and got sixpence. It must have been a fine sight. And at last, after months of labor, the boat was finished. Oh! the deportment of Peter as he saw it growing more and more like a great thrush's nest. From the very beginning of the building of it he slept by its side, and often woke up to say sweet things to it, and after it was lined with mud and the mud had dried he always slept in it. He sleeps in his nest still, and has a fascinating way of curling round in it, for it is just large enough to hold him comfortably when he curls round like a kitten. It is brown inside, of course, but outside it is mostly green, being woven of grass and twigs, and when these wither or snap the walls are thatched to fresh. There are also a few feathers here and there, which came off the thrushes while they were building. The other birds were extremely jealous and said that the boat would not balance on the water, but it lay most beautifully steady, they said the water would come into it but no water came into it. Next they said that Peter had no oars, and this caused the thrushes to look at each other in dismay, but Peter replied that he had no need of oars, for he had a sail, and with such a proud, happy face he produced a sail which he had fashioned out of this nightgown, and though it was still rather like a nightgown it made a lovely sail. And that night, the moon being full, and all the birds asleep, he did enter his coracle, as Master Francis Pretty would have said, and depart out of the island. And first, he knew not why, he looked upward, with his hands clasped, and from that moment his eyes were pinned to the west. He had promised the thrushes to begin by making short voyages, with them to his guides, but far away he saw the Kensington Gardens beckoning to him beneath the bridge, and he could not wait. His face was flushed, but he never looked back, 
there was an exultation in his little breast that drove out fear. Was Peter the least gallant of the English mariners who have sailed westward to meet the unknown? At first, his boat turned round and round, and he was driven back to the place of his starting, whereupon he shortened sail by removing one of the sleeves, and was forthwith carried backward by a contrary breeze, to his no small peril. He now let go the sail, with the result that he was drifted toward the far shore, where are black shadows he knew not the dangers of, but suspected them, and so once more hoisted his nightgown and went rumor of the shadows until he caught a favoring wind, which bore him westward, but at so great a speed that he was like to be broke against the bridge, which, having avoided, he passed under the bridge and came, to his great rejoicing, within full sight of the delectable gardens. But having tried to cast anchor, which was a stone at the end of a piece of the kite string, he found no bottom, and was fain to hold off, seeking for moorage, and, feeling his way, he buffeted against a sunken reef that cast him overboard by the greatness of the shock, and he was near to being drowned, but clambered back into the vessel. There now arose a mighty storm, accompanied by roaring of waters, such as he had never heard the like, and he was tossed this way and that, and his hands so numbed with the cold that he could not close them. Having escaped the danger of which, he was mercifully carried into a small bay, where his boat rode at peace. Nevertheless, he was not yet in safety, for, on pretending to disembark, he found a multitude of small people drawn up on the shore to contest his landing, and shouting shrilly to him to be off, for it was long past lockout time. This, with much brandishing of their holly leaves, and also a company of them carried an arrow which some boy had left in the gardens, and this they were prepared to use as a battering ram. Then Peter, who knew them for the fairies, called out that he was not an ordinary human and had no desire to do them displeasure, but to be their friend, nevertheless, having found a jolly harbour, he was in no temper to draw off therefrom, and he warned them if they sought to mischief him to stand to their harms. So saying, he boldly leapt ashore, and they gathered around him with intent to slay him, but there then arose a great cry among the women, and it was because they had now observed that his sail was a baby's nightgown. Whereupon, they straightway loved him, and grieved that their laps were too small, the which I cannot explain, except by saying that such is the way of women. The men fairies now sheathed their weapons on observing the behavior of their women, on whose intelligence they set great store, and they led him civilly to their queen, who conferred upon him the courtesy of the gardens after lockout time, and henceforth Peter could go whither he chose, and the fairies had orders to put him in comfort. Such was his first voyage to the gardens, and you may gather from the antiquity of the language that it took place a long time ago. But Peter never grows any older, and if we could be watching for him under the bridge tonight, but, of course, we can't, I dare say we should see him hoisting his nightgown and sailing or paddling toward us in the thrush's nest. When he sails, he sits down, but he stands up to paddle. I shall tell you presently how he got his paddle. Long before the time for the opening of the gates comes he steals back to the island, for people must not see him, he is not so human as all that, but this gives him hours for play, and he plays exactly as real children play. At least he thinks so, and it is one of the pathetic things about him that he often plays quite wrongly. You see, he had no one to tell him how children really play, for the fairies were all more or less in hiding until dusk, and so know nothing, and though the buds pretended that they could tell him a great deal, when the time for telling came, it was wonderful how little they really knew. They told him the truth about hide and seek, and he often plays it by himself, but even the ducks on the round pond could not explain to him what it is that makes the pond so fascinating to boys. Every night the ducks have forgotten all the events of the day, except the number of pieces of cake thrown to them. They are gloomy creatures, and say that cake is not what it was in their young days. 
So Peter had to find out many things for himself. He often played ships at the round pond, but his ship was only a hoop which he had found on the grass. Of course, he had never seen a hoop, and he wondered what you play at with them, and decided that you play at pretending they are boats. This hoop always sank at once, but he waded in for it, and sometimes he dragged it gleefully round the rim of the pond, and he was quite proud to think that he had discovered what boys do with hoops. Another time, when he found a child's pail, he thought it was for sitting in, and he sat so hard in it that he could scarcely get out of it. Also he found a balloon. It was bobbing about on the hump, quite as if it was having a game by itself, and he caught it after an exciting chase. But he thought it was a ball, and Jenny Wren had told him that boys kick balls, so he kicked it, and after that he could not find it anywhere. Perhaps the most surprising thing he found was a perambulator. It was under a lime tree, near the entrance to the Fairy Queen's Winter Palace, which is within the circle of the seven Spanish chestnuts, and Peter approached it warily, for the birds had never mentioned such things to him. Lest it was alive, he addressed it politely, and then, as it gave no answer, he went nearer and felt it cautiously. He gave it a little push, and it ran from him, which made him think it must be alive after all but, as it had run from him, he was not afraid. So he stretched out his hand to pull it to him, but this time it ran at him, and he was so alarmed that he leapt the railing and scudded away to his boat. You must not think, however, that he was a coward, for he came back next night with a crust in one hand, and a stick in the other, but the perambulator had gone, and he never saw another one. I have promised to tell you also about his paddle. It was a child's spade which he had found near street. Govers well, and he thought it was a paddle. Do you pity Peter Pan for making these mistakes? If so, I think it rather silly of you. What I mean is that, of course, one must pity him now and then, but to pity him all the time would be impertinence. He thought he had the most splendid time in the gardens, and to think you have it is almost quite as good as really to have it. He played without ceasing, while you often waste time by being Mad Dog or Mary Annish. He could be neither of these things, for he had never heard of them, but do you think he is to be pitied for that? Oh, he was merry. He was as much merrier than you, for instance as you are merrier than your father. Sometimes he fell, like a spinning top, from sheer merriment. Have you seen a greyhound leaping the fences of the gardens? That is how Peter leaps them. And think of the music of his pipe. Gentlemen who walk home at night write to the papers to say they heard a nightingale in the gardens, but it is really Peter's pipe they hear. Of course, he had no mother, at least, what use was she to him? You can be sorry for him for that, but don't be too sorry, for the next thing I mean to tell you is how he revisited her. It was the fairies who gave him the chance. Chapter 3 The Little House Everybody has heard of the little house in the Kensington Gardens, which is the only house in the whole world that the fairies have built for humans. But no one has really seen it, except just three or four, and they have not only seen it but slept in it, and unless you sleep in it you never see it. This is because it is not there when you lie down, but it is there when you wake up and step outside. In a kind of way everyone may see it, but what you see is not really it, but only the light in the windows. You see the light after lockout time. David, for instance, saw it quite distinctly far away among the trees as we were going home from the pantomime, and Oliver Bailey saw it the night he stayed so late at the temple, which is the name of his father's office. Angela Clare, who loves to have a tooth extracted because then she is treated to tea in a shop, saw more than one light, she saw hundreds of them altogether, and this must have been the fairies building the house, 
for they builded every night and always in a different part of the gardens. She thought one of the lights was bigger than the others, though she was not quite sure, for they jumped about so, and it might have been another one that was bigger. But if it was the same one, it was Peter Pan's light. Heaps of children have seen the fight, so that is nothing. But Mamie Mannering was the famous one for whom the house was first built. Mamie was always rather a strange girl, and it was at night that she was strange. She was four years of age, and in the daytime she was the ordinary kind. She was pleased when her brother Tony, who was a magnificent fellow of six, took notice of her, and she looked up to him in the right way, and tried in vain to imitate him and was flattered rather than annoyed when he shoved her about. Also, when she was batting she would pause though the ball was in the air to point out to you that she was wearing new shoes. She was quite the ordinary kind in the daytime. But as the shades of night fell, Tony, the swaggerer, lost his contempt for Mamie and eyed her fearfully, and no wonder, for with dark there came into her face a look that I can describe only as a leery look. It was also a serene look that contrasted grandly with Tony's uneasy glances. Then he would make her presents of his favorite toys, which he always took away from her next morning, and she accepted them with a disturbing smile. The reason he was now become so wheedling and she so mysterious was, in brief, that they knew they were about to be sent to bed. It was then that Mamie was terrible. Tony entreated her not to do it tonight, and the mother and their nurse threatened her, but Mamie merely smiled her agitating smile. And by and by when they were alone with their nightlight she would start up in bed crying HSH. What was that? Tony beseeches her. It was nothing, don't, Mamie, don't and pulls the sheet over his head. It is coming nearer. She cries, Oh, look at it, Tony. It is feeling your bed with its horns, it is boring for you, oh, Tony, oh. And she desists not until he rushes downstairs in his combinations, screeching. When they came up to whip Mamie they usually found her sleeping tranquilly, not shamming, you know but really sleeping, and looking like the sweetest little angel, which seems to me to make it almost worse. But of course it was daytime when they were in the gardens, and then Tony did most of the talking. You could gather from his talk that he was a very brave boy, and no one was so proud of it as Mamie. She would have loved to have a ticket on her saying that she was his sister, and at no time did she admire him more than when he told her as he often did with splendid firmness, that one day he meant to remain behind in the gardens after the gates were closed. Oh, Tony, she would say, with awful respect, but the fairies will be so angry. I dare say, replied Tony, carelessly. Perhaps, she said, thrilling, Peter Pan will give you a sail in his boat. I shall make him, replied Tony. No wonder she was proud of him. But they should not have talked so loudly, for one day they were overheard by a fairy who had been gathering skeleton leaves, from which the little people weave their summer curtains, and after that Tony was a marked boy. They loosened the rails before he sat on them, so that down he came on the back of his head, they tripped him up by catching his bootlace and bribed the ducks to sink his boat. Nearly all the nasty accidents you meet with in the gardens occur because the fairies have taken an ill will to you, and so it behoves you to be careful what you say about them. Mamie was one of the kind who liked to fix a day for doing things, but Tony was not that kind, and when she asked him which day he was to remain behind in the gardens after lockout he merely replied, just some day, he was quite vague about which day except when she asked will it be today? and then he could always say for certain that it would not be today. So she saw that he was waiting for a real good chance. This brings us to an afternoon when the gardens were white with snow, and there was ice on the round pond, not thick enough to skate on but at least you could spoil it for tomorrow by flinging stones, 
and many bright little boys and girls were doing that. When Tony and his sister arrived they wanted to go straight to the pond, but their Aya said they must take a sharp walk first, and as she said this she glanced at the time board to see when the gardens closed that night. It read half past five. Poor Aya. She is the one who laughs continuously because there are so many white children in the world, but she was not to laugh much more that day. Well, they went up the baby walk and back, and when they returned to the time board she was surprised to see that it now read five o'clock for closing time. But she was unacquainted with the tricky ways of the fairies, and so did not see, as Mamie and Tony saw at once, that they had changed the hour because there was to be a ball tonight. She said there was only time now to walk to the top of the hump and back, and as they trotted along with her she little guessed what was thrilling their little breasts. You see the chance had come of seeing a fairy ball. Never, Tony felt, could he hope for a better chance. He had to feel this, for Mamie so plainly felt it for him. Her eager eyes asked the question, is it today? And he gasped and then nodded. Mamie slipped her hand into Tony's, and hers was hot, but his was cold. She did a very kind thing, she took off her scarf and gave it to him. In case you should feel cold, she whispered. Her face was aglow, but Tony's was very gloomy. As they turned on the top of the hump he whispered to her, I'm afraid nurse would see me, so I shan't be able to do it. Mamie admired him more than ever for being afraid of nothing but their ayah, when there were so many unknown terrors to fear, and she said aloud, Tony, I shall race you to the gate, and in a whisper, then you can hide, and off they ran. Tony could always outdistance her easily, but never had she known him speed away so quickly as now and she was sure he hurried that he might have more time to hide. Brave, brave. Her doting eyes were crying when she got a dreadful shock, instead of hiding, her hero had run out at the gate. At this bitter sight Mamie stopped blankly, as if all her look full of darling treasures were suddenly spilled, and then for very disdain she could not sob, in a swell of protest against all puling cowards she ran to street. Govers well and hid in Tony's stead. When the ayah reached the gate and saw Tony far in front she thought her other charge was with him and passed out. Twilight came on, and scores and hundreds of people passed out, including the last one, who always has to run for it, but Mamie saw them not. She had shut her eyes tight and glued them with passionate tears, when she opened them something very cold ran up her legs and up her arms and dropped into her heart. It was the stillness of the gardens. Then she heard clang, then from another part clang, then clang, clang far away. It was the closing of the gates. Immediately the last clang had died away Mamie distinctly heard a voice say, So that's all right. It had a wooden sound and seemed to come from above, and she looked up in time to see an elm tree stretching out its arms and yawning. She was about to say, I never knew you could speak. When a metallic voice that seemed to come from the ladle at the well remarked to the elm, I suppose it is a bit coldish up there? And the elm replied, not particularly, but you do get numb standing so long on one leg and he flapped his arms vigorously just as the cabmen do before they drive off. Mamie was quite surprised to see that a number of other tall trees were doing the same sort of thing and she stole away to the baby walk and crouched observantly under a Minorca holly which shrugged its shoulders but did not seem to mind her. She was not in the least cold. She was wearing a russet-colored pelisse and had the hood over her head, so that nothing of her showed except her dear little face and her curls. The rest of her real self was hidden far away inside so many warm garments that in shape she seemed rather like a ball. She was about forty round the waist. There was a good deal going on in the baby walk, 
when Mamie arrived in time to see a magnolia and a Persian lilac step over the railing and set off for a smart walk. They moved in a jerky sort of way certainly, but that was because they used crutches. An elderberry hobbled across the walk and stood chatting with some young quinces, and they all had crutches. The crutches were the sticks that are tied to young trees and shrubs. They were quite familiar objects to Mamie, but she had never known what they were for until tonight. She peeped up the walk and saw her first fairy. He was a street boy fairy who was running up the walk closing the weeping trees. The way he did it was this, he pressed a spring in the trunk and they shut like umbrellas, deluging the little plants beneath with snow. Oh, you naughty, naughty child, Mamie cried indignantly for she knew what it was to have a dripping umbrella about your ears. Fortunately the mischievous fellow was out of earshot, but the chrysanthemums heard her, and they all said so pointedly hoity-toity, what is this? That she had to come out and show herself. Then the whole vegetable kingdom was rather puzzled what to do. Of course it is no affair of ours, a spindle tree said after they had whispered together but you know quite well you ought not to be here, and perhaps our duty is to report you to the fairies. What do you think yourself? I think you should not, Mamie replied, which so perplexed them that they said petulantly there was no arguing with her. I wouldn't ask it of you, she assured them, if I thought it was wrong, and of course after this they could not well carry tales. They then said, well a day, and such is life for they can be frightfully sarcastic, but she felt sorry for those of them who had no crutches, and she said good-naturedly, before I go to the fairy's ball, I should like to take you for a walk one at a time, you can lean on me, you know. At this they clapped their hands, and she escorted them up to the baby walk and back again, one at a time, putting an arm or a finger round the very frail, setting their leg right when it got too ridiculous, and treating the foreign ones quite as courteously as the English, though she could not understand a word they said. They behaved well on the whole, though some whimpered that she had not taken them as far as she took Nancy or Grace or Dorothy, and others jagged her, but it was quite unintentional, and she was too much of a lady to cry out. So much walking tired her and she was anxious to be off to the ball, but she no longer felt afraid. The reason she felt no more fear was that it was now night time, and in the dark, you remember, Mamie was always rather strange. They were now loath to let her go, for, if the fairies see you, they warned her, they will mischief you, stab you to death or compel you to nurse their children or turn you into something tedious, like an evergreen oak. As they said this they looked with affected pity at an evergreen oak for in winter they are very envious of the evergreens. Oh, la, replied the oak bitingly, how deliciously cosy it is to stand here buttoned to the neck and watch you poor naked creatures shivering. This made them sulky though they had really brought it on themselves, and they drew for Mamie a very gloomy picture of the perils that faced her if she insisted on going to the ball. She learned from a purple filbert that the court was not in its usual good temper at present, the cause being the tantalizing heart of the Duke of Christmas Daisies. He was an oriental fairy, very poorly of a dreadful complaint, namely, inability to love, and though he had tried many ladies in many lands he could not fall in love with one of them. Queen Mab, who rules in the gardens, had been confident that her girls would bewitch him, but alas, his heart, the doctor said, remained cold. This rather irritating doctor, who was his private physician, felt the duke's heart immediately after any lady was presented, and then always shook his bald head and murmured, cold, quite cold. Naturally Queen Mab felt disgraced, and first she tried the effect of ordering the court into tears for nine minutes, and then she blamed the cupids and decreed that they should wear fool's caps until they thawed the duke's frozen heart. How I should love to see the cupids in their dear little fool's caps, Mamie cried, 
and away she ran to look for them very recklessly, for the cupids hate to be laughed at. It is always easy to discover where a fairy's ball is being held, as ribbons are stretched between it and all the populous parts of the gardens, on which those invited may walk to the dance without wetting their pumps. This night the ribbons were red and looked very pretty on the snow. Mamie walked alongside one of them for some distance without meeting anybody, but at last she saw a fairy cavalcade approaching. To her surprise they seemed to be returning from the ball, and she had just time to hide from them by bending her knees and holding out her arms and pretending to be a garden chair. There were six horsemen in front and six behind, in the middle walked a prim lady wearing a long train held up by two pages, and on the train, as if it were a couch, reclined a lovely girl, for in this way do aristocratic fairies travel about. She was dressed in golden rain, but the most enviable part of her was her neck, which was blue in color and of a velvet texture, and of course showed off her diamond necklace as no white throat could have glorified it. The high-born fairies obtain this admired effect by pricking their skin, which lets the blue blood come through and dye them, and you cannot imagine anything so dazzling unless you have seen the ladies' busts in the jeweler's windows. Mamie also noticed that the whole cavalcade seemed to be in a passion, tilting their noses higher than it can be safe for even fairies to tilt them, and she concluded that this must be another case in which the doctor had said cold, quite cold. Well, she followed the ribbon to a place where it became a bridge over a dry puddle into which another fairy had fallen and been unable to climb out. At first this little damsel was afraid of Mamie, who most kindly went to her aid, but soon she sat in her hand chatting gaily and explaining that her name was Brownie, and that though only a poor street singer she was on her way to the ball to see if the Duke would have her. Of course, she said, I am rather plain, and this made Mamie uncomfortable, for indeed the simple little creature was almost quite plain for a fairy. It was difficult to know what to reply. I see you think I have no chance, Brownie said falteringly. I don't say that, Mamie answered politely, of course your face is just a tiny bit homely, but, really it was quite awkward for her. Fortunately she remembered about her father and the bazaar. He had gone to a fashionable bazaar where all the most beautiful ladies in London were on view for half a crown the second day, but on his return home instead of being dissatisfied with Mamie's mother he had said, You can't think, my dear, what a relief it is to see a homely face again. Mamie repeated this story, and it fortified Brownie tremendously, indeed she had no longer the slightest doubt that the Duke would choose her. So she scudded away up the ribbon, calling out to Mamie not to follow lest the Queen should mischief her. But Mamie's curiosity tugged her forward, and presently at the seven Spanish chestnuts, she saw a wonderful light. She crept forward until she was quite near it, and then she peeped from behind a tree. The light, which was as high as your head above the ground, was composed of myriads of glowworms, all holding on to each other, and so forming a dazzling canopy over the fairy ring. There were thousands of little people looking on, but they were in shadow and drab in color compared to the glorious creatures within that luminous circle who were so bewilderingly bright that Mamie had to wink hard all the time she looked at them. It was amazing and even irritating to her that the Duke of Christmas Daisies should be able to keep out of love for a moment, yet out of love his dusky gray still was, you could see it by the shamed looks of the Queen and Court, though they pretended not to care by the way darling ladies brought forward for his approval burst into tears as they were told to pass on, and by his own most dreary face. Mamie could also see the pompous doctor feeling the duke's heart and hear him give utterance to his parrot cry, and she was particularly sorry for the cupids, who stood in their fool's caps in obscure places and, every time they heard that cold, quite cold, bowed their disgraced little heads. She was disappointed not to see Peter Pan, and I may as well tell you now why he was so late that night. 
It was because his boat had got wedged on the serpentine between fields of floating ice, through which he had to break a perilous passage with his trusty paddle. The fairies had as yet scarcely missed him, for they could not dance, so heavy were their hearts. They forget all the steps when they are sad, and remember them again when they are merry. David tells me that fairies never say we feel happy, what they say is, we feel dancey. Well, they were looking very undancy indeed, when sudden laughter broke out among the onlookers, caused by Brownie, who had just arrived and was insisting on her right to be presented to the Duke. Mamie craned forward eagerly to see how her friend fared, though she had really no hope, no one seemed to have the least hope except Brownie herself who, however, was absolutely confident. She was led before his grace, and the doctor putting a finger carelessly on the ducal heart, which for convenience sake was reached by a little trapdoor in his diamond shirt, had begun to say mechanically, cold, key, when he stopped abruptly. What's this? He cried, and first he shook the heart like a watch, and then put his ear to it. Bless my soul, cried the doctor, and by this time of course the excitement among the spectators was tremendous, fairies fainting right and left. Everybody stared breathlessly at the duke, who was very much startled and looked as if he would like to run away. Good gracious me! The doctor was heard muttering, and now the heart was evidently on fire, for he had to jerk his fingers away from it and put them in his mouth. The suspense was awful. Then in a loud voice, and bowing low, My Lord Duke, said the physician elatedly, I have the honor to inform your excellency that your grace is in love. You can't conceive the effect of it. Brownie held out her arms to the duke and he flung himself into them. The queen leapt into the arms of the Lord Chamberlain, and the ladies of the court leapt into the arms of her gentlemen, for it is etiquette to follow her example in everything. Thus in a single moment about fifty marriages took place, for if you leap into each other's arms it is a fairy wedding. Of course a clergyman has to be present. How the crowd cheered and leapt. Trumpets brayed, the moon came out and immediately a thousand couples seized hold of its rays as if they were ribbons in a May dance and waltzed in wild abandon round the fairy ring. Most gladsome sight of all, the cupids plucked the hated fool's caps from their heads and cast them high in the air. And then Mamie went and spoiled everything. She couldn't help it. She was crazy with delight over her little friend's good fortune so she took several steps forward and cried in an ecstasy, Oh, Brownie, how splendid! Everybody stood still, the music ceased, the lights went out, and all in the time you may take to say oh dear. An awful sense of her peril came upon Mamie, too late she remembered that she was a lost child in a place where no human must be between the locking and the opening of the gates, she heard the murmur of an angry multitude, she saw a thousand swords flashing for her blood, and she uttered a cry of terror and fled. How she ran! And all the time her eyes were starting out of her head. Many times she lay down, and then quickly jumped up and ran on again. Her little mind was so entangled in terrors that she no longer knew she was in the gardens. The one thing she was sure of was that she must never cease to run, and she thought she was still running long after she had dropped in the figs and gone to sleep. She thought the snowflakes falling on her face were her mother kissing her good night. She thought her coverlet of snow was a warm blanket, and tried to pull it over her head. And when she heard talking through her dreams she thought it was mother bringing father to the nursery door to look at her as she slept. But it was the fairies. I am very glad to be able to say that they no longer desired to mischief her. When she rushed away they had rent the air with such cries as slay her, turn her into something extremely unpleasant, and so on, but the pursuit was delayed while they discussed who should march in front, and this gave Duchess Brownie time to cast herself before the Queen and demand a boon.
Every bride has a right to a boon, and what she asked for was Mamie's life. Anything except that, replied Queen Mab sternly, and all the fairies chanted anything except that. But when they learned how Mamie had befriended Brownie and so enabled her to attend the ball to their great glory and renown, they gave three huzzes for the little human, and set off, like an army, to thank her, the court advancing in front and the canopy keeping step with it. They traced Mamie easily by her footprints in the snow, but though they found her deep in snow in the figs, it seemed impossible to thank Mamie, for they could not waken her. They went through the form of thanking her, that is to say, the new king stood on her body and read her a long address of welcome, but she heard not a word of it. They also cleared the snow off her, but soon she was covered again, and they saw she was in danger of perishing of cold. Turn her into something that does not mind the cold, seemed a good suggestion of the doctors, but the only thing they could think of that does not mind cold was a snowflake. And it might melt, the queen pointed out, so that idea had to be given up. A magnificent attempt was made to carry her to a sheltered spot, but though there were so many of them she was too heavy. By this time all the ladies were crying in their handkerchiefs, but presently the cupids had a lovely idea. Build a house round her, they cried, and at once everybody perceived that this was the thing to do. In a moment a hundred fairy sawyers were among the branches, architects were running round Mamie, measuring her, a bricklayer's yard sprang up at her feet, seventy-five masons rushed up with a foundation stone and the queen laid it, overseers were appointed to keep the boys off, scaffoldings were run up, the whole place rang with hammers and chisels and turning lathes, and by this time the roof was on and that the glaziers were putting in the windows. The house was exactly the size of Mamie and perfectly lovely. One of her arms was extended and this had bothered them for a second, but they built a veranda round it, leading to the front door. The windows were the size of a colored picture book and the door rather smaller, but it would be easy for her to get out by taking off the roof. The fairies, as is their custom, clapped their hands with delight over their cleverness, and they were all so madly in love with the little house that they could not bear to think they had finished it. So they gave it ever so many little extra touches, and even then they added more extra touches. For instance, two of them ran up a ladder and put on a chimney. Now we fear it is quite finished, they sighed. But no, for another two ran up the ladder and tied some smoke to the chimney. That certainly finishes it, they cried reluctantly. Not at all, cried a glow worm, if she were to wake without seeing a nightlight she might be frightened, so I shall be her nightlight. Wait one moment, said a china merchant, and I shall make you a saucer. Now alas, it was absolutely finished. Oh, dear no. Gracious me, cried a brass manufacturer, there's no handle on the door, and he put one on. An ironmonger added a scraper and an old lady ran up with a door mat. Carpenters arrived with a water butt, and the painters insisted on painting it. Finished at last. Finished. How can it be finished, the plumber demanded scornfully, before hot and cold are put in. And he put in hot and cold. Then an army of gardeners arrived with fairy carts and spades and seeds and bulbs and forcing houses, and soon they had a flower garden to the right of the veranda and a vegetable garden to the left, and roses and clematis on the walls of the house, and in less time than five minutes all these dear things were in full bloom. Oh, how beautiful the little house was now! But it was at last finished true as true and they had to leave it and return to the dance. They all kissed their hands to it as they went away, and the last to go was Brownie. She stayed a moment behind the others to drop a pleasant dream down the chimney. All through the night the exquisite little house stood there in the figs taking care of Mamie, and she never knew.
She slept until the dream was quite finished and woke feeling deliciously cozy just as morning was breaking from its egg, and then she almost fell asleep again, and then she called out. Tony, for she thought she was at home in the nursery. As Tony made no answer, she sat up, whereupon her head hit the roof, and it opened like the lid of a box, and to her bewilderment she saw all around her the Kensington Gardens lying deep in snow. As she was not in the nursery she wondered whether this was really herself, so she pinched her cheeks, and then she knew it was herself, and this reminded her that she was in the middle of a great adventure. She remembered now everything that had happened to her from the closing of the gates up to her running away from the fairies, but however, she asked herself, had she got into this funny place? She stepped out by the roof, right over the garden, and then she saw the dear house in which she had passed the night. It so entranced her that she could think of nothing else. Oh, you darling, oh, you sweet, oh, you love, she cried. Perhaps a human voice frightened the little house, or maybe it now knew that its work was done, for no sooner had Mamie spoken than it began to grow smaller, it shrank so slowly that she could scarce believe it was shrinking yet she soon knew that it could not contain her now. It always remained as complete as ever, but it became smaller and smaller, and the garden dwindled at the same time, and the snow crept closer, lapping house and garden up. Now the house was the size of a little dog's kennel, and now of a Noah's Ark, but still you could see the smoke and the door handle and the roses on the wall, every one complete. The glow-worm fight was waning too, but it was still there. Darling, loveliest, don't go, Mamie cried, falling on her knees, for the little house was now the size of a reel of thread, but still quite complete. But as she stretched out her arms imploringly the snow crept up on all sides until it met itself, and where the little house had been was now one unbroken expanse of snow. Mamie stamped her foot naughtily, and was putting her fingers to her eyes, when she heard a kind voice say, Don't cry, pretty human, don't cry, and then she turned round and saw a beautiful little naked boy regarding her wistfully. She knew at once that he must be Peter Pan. Chapter 4 Lockout Time It is frightfully difficult to know much about the fairies, and almost the only thing known for certain is that there are fairies wherever there are children. Long ago children were forbidden the gardens, and at that time there was not a fairy in the place, then the children were admitted, and the fairies came trooping in that very evening. They can't resist following the children, but you seldom see them, partly because they live in the daytime behind the railings, where you are not allowed to go and also partly because they are so cunning. They are not a bit cunning after lockout, but until lockout, my word. When you were a bird you knew the fairies pretty well, and you remember a good deal about them in your babyhood, which it is a great pity you can't write down, for gradually you forget, and I have heard of children who declared that they had never once seen a fairy. Very likely if they said this in the Kensington Gardens, they were standing looking at a fairy all the time. The reason they were cheated was that she pretended to be something else. This is one of their best tricks. They usually pretend to be flowers, because the court sits in the fairy's basin, and there are so many flowers there, and all along the baby walk, that a flower is the thing least likely to attract attention. They dress exactly like flowers, and change with the seasons, putting on white when lilies are in and blue for blue bells, and so on. They like crocus and hyacinth time best of all, as they are partial to a bit of color, but tulips, except white ones, which are the fairy cradles, they consider garish, and they sometimes put off dressing like tulips for days, so that the beginning of the tulip weeks is almost the best time to catch them. When they think you are not looking they skip along pretty lively, but if you look and they fear there is no time to hide, they stand quite still, pretending to be flowers. Then, 
After you have passed without knowing that they were fairies, they rush home and tell their mothers they have had such an adventure. The fairy basin, you remember, is all covered with ground ivy, from which they make their castor oil, with flowers growing in it here and there. Most of them really are flowers, but some of them are fairies. You never can be sure of them, but a good plan is to walk by looking the other way, and then turn round sharply. Another good plan, which David and I sometimes follow, is to stare them down. After a long time they can't help winking, and then you know for certain that they are fairies. There are also numbers of them along the baby walk, which is a famous gentle place, as spots frequented by fairies are called. Once twenty-four of them had an extraordinary adventure. They were a girl's school out for a walk with the governess, and all wearing hyacinth gowns, when she suddenly put her finger to her mouth, and then they all stood still on an empty bed and pretended to be hyacinths. Unfortunately, what the governess had heard was two gardeners coming to plant new flowers in that very bed. They were wheeling a handcart with flowers in it, and were quite surprised to find the bed occupied. Pity to lift them hyacinths, said the one man. Duke's orders, replied the other, and, having emptied the cart, they dug up the boarding school and put the poor, terrified things in it in five rows. Of course, neither the governess nor the girls dare let on that they were fairies, so they were carted far away to a potting shed, out of which they escaped in the night without their shoes, but there was a great row about it among the parents, and the school was ruined. As for their houses, it is no use looking for them, because they are the exact opposite of our houses. You can see our houses by day, but you can't see them by dark. Well, you can see their houses by dark, but you can't see them by day, for they are the color of night, and I never heard of anyone yet who could see night in the daytime. This does not mean that they are black, for night has its colors just as day has, but ever so much brighter. Their blues and reds and greens are like ours with a light behind them. The palace is entirely built of many colored glasses, and is quite the loveliest of all royal residences, but the queen sometimes complains because the common people will peep in to see what she is doing. They are very inquisitive folk, and press quite hard against the glass, and that is why their noses are mostly snubby. The streets are miles long and very twisty, and have paths on each side made of bright worsted. The birds used to steal the worsted for their nests, but a policeman has been appointed to hold on at the other end. One of the great differences between the fairies and us is that they never do anything useful. When the first baby laughed for the first time, his laugh broke into a million pieces, and they all went skipping about. That was the beginning of fairies. They look tremendously busy, you know, as if they had not a moment to spare, but if you were to ask them what they are doing, they could not tell you in the least. They are frightfully ignorant, and everything they do is make-believe. They have a postman, but he never calls except at Christmas with his little box, and though they have beautiful schools, nothing is taught in them, the youngest child being chief person is always elected mistress, and when she has called the role, they all go out for a walk and never come back. It is a very noticeable thing that, in fairy families, the youngest is always chief person, and usually becomes a prince or princess, and children remember this, and think it must be so among humans also, and that is why they are often made uneasy when they come upon their mother furtively putting new frills on the bassinet. You have probably observed that your baby sister wants to do all sorts of things that your mother and her nurse want her not to do, to stand up at sitting down time, and to sit down at standing up time, for instance, or to wake up when she should fall asleep, or to crawl on the floor when she is wearing her best frock, and so on, and perhaps you put this down to naughtiness. But it is not, it simply means that she is doing as she has seen the fairies do. She begins by following their ways, and it takes about two years to get her into the human ways. Her fits of passion, 
which are awful to behold, and are usually called teething, are no such thing, they are her natural exasperation, because we don't understand her, though she is talking an intelligible language. She is talking, fairy. The reason mothers and nurses know what her remarks mean, before other people know, as that gutch means give it to me at once, while why is why do you wear such a funny hat? Is because, mixing so much with babies, they have picked up a little of the fairy language. Of late David has been thinking back hard about the fairy tongue, with his hands clutching his temples, and he has remembered a number of their phrases which I shall tell you some day if I don't forget. He had heard them in the days when he was a thrush, and though I suggested to him that perhaps it is really bird language he is remembering, he says not, for these phrases are about fun and adventures, and the birds talked of nothing but nest building. He distinctly remembers that the birds used to go from spot to spot like ladies at shop windows, looking at the different nests and saying, Not my color, my dear, and how would that do with a soft lining? And but will it wear? And what hideous trimming? And so on. The fairies are exquisite dancers, and that is why one of the first things the baby does is to sign to you to dance to him and then to cry when you do it. They hold their great balls in the open air, in what is called a fairy ring. For weeks afterward you can see the ring on the grass. It is not there when they begin, but they make it by waltzing round and round. Sometimes you will find mushrooms inside the ring, and these are fairy chairs that the servants have forgotten to clear away. The chairs and the rings are the only telltale marks these little people leave behind them and they would remove even these were they not so fond of dancing that they tow it till the very moment of the opening of the gates. David and I once found a ferrering quite warm. But there is also a way of finding out about the ball before it takes place. You know the boards which tell at what time the gardens are to close today. Well, these tricky fairies sometimes slyly change the board on a ball night, so that it says the gardens are to close at 6.30 for instance, instead of at 7. This enables them to get begun half an hour earlier. If on such a night we could remain behind in the gardens, as the famous Mamie Mannering did, we might see delicious sights, hundreds of lovely fairies hastening to the ball, the married ones wearing their wedding rings round their waists, the gentlemen, all in uniform, holding up the ladies' trains, and Linkman running in front carrying winter cherries, which are the fairy lanterns, the cloakroom where they put on their silver slippers and get a ticket for their wraps, the flowers streaming up from the baby walk to look on, and always welcome because they can lend a pin, the supper table, with Queen Mab at the head of it, and behind her chair the Lord Chamberlain, who carries a dandelion on which he blows when Her Majesty wants to know the time. The tablecloth varies according to the seasons, and in May it is made of chestnut blossom. The way the fairy servants do is this, the men, scores of them, climb up the trees and shake the branches, and the blossom falls like snow. Then the lady servants sweep it together by whisking their skirts until it is exactly like a tablecloth, and that is how they get their tablecloth. They have real glasses and real wine of three kinds, namely, blackthorn wine, Burberry's wine, and cowslip wine, and the queen pours out, but the bottles are so heavy that she just pretends to pour out. There is bread and butter to begin with, of the size of a threepenny bit, and cakes to end with, and they are so small that they have no crumbs. The fairies sit round on mushrooms, and at first they are very well behaved and always cough off the table, and so on, but after a bit they are not so well behaved and stick their fingers into the butter, which is got from the roots of old trees, and the really horrid ones crawl over the tablecloth chasing sugar or other delicacies with their tongues. When the queen sees them doing this she signs to the servants to wash up and put away, and then everybody adjourns to the dance the queen walking in front while the Lord Chamberlain walks behind her, carrying two little pots, 
one of which contains the juice of wallflower and the other the juice of Solomon's seals. Wallflower juice is good for reviving dancers who fall to the ground in a fit, and Solomon's seals juice is for bruises. They bruise very easily and when Peter plays faster and faster they foot it till they fall down in fits. For, as you know without my telling you, Peter Pan is the fairy's orchestra. He sits in the middle of the ring, and they would never dream of having a smart dance nowadays without him. P. P. is written on the corner of the invitation card sent out by all really good families. They are grateful little people, too, and at the princess's coming-of-age ball, they come of age on their second birthday and have a birthday every month, they gave him the wish of his heart. The way it was done was this. The queen ordered him to kneel, and then said that for playing so beautifully she would give him the wish of his heart. Then they all gathered round Peter to hear what was the wish of his heart, but for a long time he hesitated, not being certain what it was himself. If I chose to go back to mother, he asked at last, could you give me that wish? Now this question vexed them, for were he to return to his mother they should lose his music, so the queen tilted her nose contemptuously and said, Pooh, ask for a much bigger wish than that. Is that quite a little wish? He inquired. As little as this, the queen answered, putting her hands near each other. What size is a big wish? He asked. She measured it off on her skirt, and it was a very handsome length. Then Peter reflected and said, Well, then, I think I shall have two little wishes instead of one big one. Of course, the fairies had to agree, though his cleverness rather shocked them, and he said that his first wish was to go to his mother, but with the right to return to the gardens if he found her disappointing. His second wish he would hold in reserve. They tried to dissuade him, and even put obstacles in the way. I can give you the power to fly to her house, the queen said but I can't open the door for you. The window I flew out it will be open, Peter said confidently. Mother always keeps it open in the hope that I may fly back. How do you know? They asked, quite surprised, and, really, Peter could not explain how he knew. I just do know, he said. So as he persisted in his wish, they had to grant it. The way they gave him power to fly was this, they all tickled him on the shoulder, and soon he felt a funny itching in that part and then up he rose higher and higher and flew away out of the gardens and over the housetops. It was so delicious that instead of flying straight to his old home he skimmed away over St. Paul's to the Crystal Palace and back by the river and Regent's Park, and by the time he reached his mother's window he had quite made up his mind that his second wish should be to become a bird. The window was wide open, just as he knew it would be, and in he fluttered, and there was his mother lying asleep. Peter alighted softly on the wooden rail at the foot of the bed, and had a good look at her. She lay with her head on her hand, and the hollow in the pillow was like a nest lined with her brown wavy hair. He remembered, though he had long forgotten it, that she always gave her hair a holiday at night. How sweet the frills of her nightgown were. He was very glad she was such a pretty mother. But she looked sad, and he knew why she looked sad. One of her arms moved as if it wanted to go round something, and he knew what it wanted to go round. Oh, mother, said Peter to himself if you just knew who is sitting on the rail at the foot of the bed. Very gently he patted the little mound that her feet made, and he could see by her face that she liked it. He knew he had but to say mother ever so softly, and she would wake up. They always wake up at once if it is you that says their name. Then she would give such a joyous cry and squeeze him tight. How nice that would be to him, but oh, how exquisitely delicious it would be to her. That I am afraid is how Peter regarded it. In returning to his mother he never doubted that he was giving her the greatest treat a woman can have. Nothing can be more splendid, 
he thought, than to have a little boy of your own. How proud of him they are, and very right and proper, too. But why does Peter sit so long on the rail, why does he not tell his mother that he has come back? I quite shrink from the truth, which is that he sat there in two minds. Sometimes he looked longingly at his mother, and sometimes he looked longingly at the window. Certainly it would be pleasant to be her boy again, but, on the other hand, what times those had been in the gardens. Was he so sure that he would enjoy wearing clothes again? He popped off the bed and opened some drawers to have a look at his old garments. They were still there, but he could not remember how you put them on. The socks, for instance, were they worn on the hands or on the feet? He was about to try one of them on his hand, when he had a great adventure. Perhaps the drawer had creaked, at any rate, his mother woke up, for he heard her say Peter, as if it was the most lovely word in the language. He remained sitting on the floor and held his breath, wondering how she knew that he had come back. If she said Peter again, he meant to cry mother and run to her. But she spoke no more, she made little moans only, and when next he peeped at her she was once more asleep, with tears on her face. It made Peter very miserable, and what do you think was the first thing he did? Sitting on the rail at the foot of the bed, he played a beautiful lullaby to his mother on his pipe. He had made it up himself out of the way she said Peter, and he never stopped playing until she looked happy. He thought this so clever of him that he could scarcely resist wakening her to hear her say, Oh, Peter, how exquisitely you play. However, as she now seemed comfortable, he again cast looks at the window. You must not think that he meditated flying away and never coming back. He had quite decided to be his mother's boy, but hesitated about beginning tonight. It was the second wish which troubled him. He no longer meant to make it a wish to be a bird, but not to ask for a second wish seemed wasteful, and, of course, he could not ask for it without returning to the fairies. Also, if he put off asking for his wish too long it might go bad. He asked himself if he had not been hard-hearted to fly away without saying goodbye to Solomon. I should like awfully to sail in my boat just once more, he said wistfully to his sleeping mother. He quite argued with her as if she could hear him. It would be so splendid to tell the birds of this adventure, he said coaxingly. I promise to come back, he said solemnly and meant it, too. And in the end, you know, he flew away. Twice he came back from the window, wanting to kiss his mother, but he feared the delight of it might waken her, so at last he played her a lovely kiss on his pipe, and then he flew back to the gardens. Many nights and even months passed before he asked the fairies for his second wish, and I am not sure that I quite know why he delayed so long. One reason was that he had so many goodbyes to say, not only to his particular friends, but to a hundred favorite spots. Then he had his last sail, and his very last sail, and his last sail of all, and so on. Again, a number of farewell feasts were given in his honor, and another comfortable reason was that, after all, there was no hurry, for his mother would never weary of waiting for him. This last reason displeased old Solomon, for it was an encouragement to the birds to procrastinate. Solomon had several excellent mottos for keeping them at their work, such as never put off laying today, because you can lay tomorrow, and in this world there are no second chances, and yet here was Peter gaily putting off and none the worse for it. The birds pointed this out to each other, and fell into lazy habits. But, mind you, Though Peter was so slow in going back to his mother, he was quite decided to go back. The best proof of this was his caution with the fairies. They were most anxious that he should remain in the gardens to play to them, and to bring this to pass they tried to trick him into making such a remark as I wish the grass was not so wet, and some of them danced out of time in the hope that he might cry, I do wish you would keep time.
then they would have said that this was his second wish. But he smoked their design, and though on occasions he began, I wish, he always stopped in time. So when at last he said to them bravely, I wish now to go back to mother forever and always, they had to tickle his shoulder and let him go. He went in a hurry in the end because he had dreamt that his mother was crying, and he knew what was the great thing she cried for, and that a hug from her splendid Peter would quickly make her to smile. Oh, he felt sure of it, and so eager was he to be nestling in her arms that this time he flew straight to the window, which was always to be open for him. But the window was closed, and there were iron bars on it, and peering inside he saw his mother sleeping peacefully with her arm round another little boy. Peter called, Mother! Mother! But she heard him not, in vain he beat his little limbs against the iron bars. He had to fly back, sobbing, to the gardens, and he never saw his dear again. What a glorious boy he had meant to be to her! Ah, Peter, we who have made the great mistake, how differently we should all act at the second chance. But Solomon was right, there is no second chance, not for most of us. When we reach the window it is lockout time. The iron bars are up for life. The End If you like this story, subscribe to my channel.